This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. The conversation that you tuned in to hear features Chris Themelko from the Melbourne-based outfit Orpheus Omega. Now, the catalyst for the chat is twofold. The lads have a tour booked with their mates in Triple Kill. It'll take in a few dates on the east coast of Australia and to celebrate the tour, or maybe it's the other way around, either way, they've got a split EP coming out. It's a pretty rare thing to do these days, but they cover family favourites. Let's put it that way. So here he is, Chris Themelko from the Melbourne outfit, Orpheus Omega. Hey, man, how are you? Mate, 10 out of 10. <laughs> two minutes two, and you're on time, mate. It says a lot about somebody's uh, ability to get shit done, as far as I'm concerned, when you're on time. Thank you. Oh, that's, probably, that's all good. Oh, I, it's probably, it probably says more about me not having anything else to do other than music. So, there's... <laughs> are you in Brisbane too, are you? No, no, no. I'm, I'm in um, Melbourne. Oh, but, God. Um, I'm literally, um, I'll give you a nice quick pan. I'm currently in my studio, which is my main workplace. So... I don't, Man, look I don't, at that. I don't really uh, leave the room that often. So that's a studio, brother. That's awesome, mate. That's just geared for sound. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good. It's good. It's it's you know, it's not anything um big and ridiculous, but it um you know, it's been it's it's been the home for Monolith Studios for the last seven years. So it's been it's comfy. It's definitely comfy. Uh, we're in the middle of a lockdown at the moment. You might have seen in the mainstream media they're gleefully reporting that we've gone back into one. But are you guys in one now? Where 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 are you at? Sorry. Uh, Gold Coast. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, we're. Um, I mean, we've got our restrictions and stuff, just to you know, like sort of capacity limits and masks indoors. But otherwise, we're um, we're doing okay. Fingers crossed. Are you yeah. guys um two weeks a week or what are you? What was it? Oh, it's the little snap lockdown, isn't it? Actually, yeah. Three, three days yeah. and two people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, you just think. I mean, look. Far be it for me to get too political. Occasionally I do, mm. I must confess, but I can't stand these lockdowns because they. Yeah. Uh, there is a, with the greatest of respect, I say this, people with comorbidities, disabilities, this sort of thing, I absolutely understand the concern for their mm. welfare and I'm not discounting that, but you're talking about less than 10% of the population or there or thereabouts, maybe 15% at a push, the other 85%, the small business owners, the bands. Life still has to keep moving forward. And unfortunately, Victoria's politics is very similar to California's and New York's, where it's just, well, we've got some cases, let's lock it down. And there's all this blame that goes onto the feds about it, when ultimately it's not necessarily about that. It's it's about handling what's in front of you. And Gladys Berejiklian from New South Wales, I think, had the right idea up until ironically right now where she's gone into a big lockdown, but surgical lockdowns because people could still function. I think realistically, I don't think any of it works, to be honest, because you can't have something that's based around a zero case scenario for something that has any kind of exponential growth. It doesn't, it Mm -hmm. literally doesn't work. So I was all for lockdowns at the start because like, it was like, we don't know what's going on. We don't know how, yeah, I totally fair. It's, you know, politicians and health advisors and the rest of it, they only have the information they have at the time. Granted, this time la- oh, earlier than this time last year, no one had any answers. 16 to 18 months later, should have fucking sorted it. Like, like there should have been, there really should have been um, regional-based um, quarantine places that are out of the way. Um, the, the vaccine rollout should have been way better than what it is. The fact that the way this low in the world for that at the moment is, is ridiculous in itself. But again, we're pretty much just doing the same thing we did at the start of last year with no changes. Like, we got lucky because we're an island nation and it wasn't really that we did well. We literally just said, oh, we're just not going to bring anyone in. Like, borders, that was it. Yeah. That was that was how, yeah, that was it. And so lockdowns. now it's like, well, mm. exactly. So it's, um, you know, we're pretty much just in the same spot because no one's changed anything. No one's made any improvements. And that's that's where we're at. So it's um, frustrating is uh, an understatement. Yeah, agree wholeheartedly, mate. And I've seen what it's done to the music industry, particularly yeah. in Victoria. And Melbourne for many mm. years has been the epicentre of the music industry in Australia from a live music mm. perspective and uh, the fact that, that artists, I mean, ha, what could you do? I mean, as soon mm. as, to your point, it's not it's a zero-sum game from the perspective yeah. that as soon as there is a single case, the likelihood of going into a lockdown in predominantly labour-led states is mm. pretty much a statistical one. 
it's a 100% likelihood and or near to. And uh, mate, as a band like with you guys, I've spoken to so many Australian artists over the past 12 months. You just don't know what the hell's going on. It's just, I've got to say, it's the same in, in Europe and in the States too, in England, uh, in Britain in particular, and uh, and in the United States as well. It's just all you can do is just do those, I don't like them, to be honest, you know, those slay at home things that metal injection are yeah, doing. And yeah. I, 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 look, I'm a heavy metal and extreme metal music fan. You create the music, okay? The fire pit is the live arena. It goes yeah, back 100%. to our tribal roots. Yeah. We need it for our mental yeah. health. 100%. We, we have to have it. So stop denying it. If there's a couple of cases, stop more than a couple of cases. I think, oh, where was I reading? Scotland has something like 15,000 ongoing cases at the moment. And mm. I don't even think they're in, they're in lockdown. Mm. And they're pretty left leaning up there in Scotland. I, you know, I, so. I don't, I, I would have cared more from the political side of it earlier on, but Nick, like, I don't think, I, I don't think I see the distinction as much now because like New South Wales tried to avoid a lockdown. Fair enough. That's like, that's what, you know, New South Wales has been pretty adamant about that, especially with how many people they get in on flights and stuff, because they are taking more than the other the other states overall. Um, but they they did the only thing they could because there was no way they were going to catch up to 30 cases a day with no lockdown because those 30 will become 60 at some point. That's yeah. You know, there's no there's no amount of contract tracing that's going to stop that. Um, but but it's just the fact that that solution is not a solution anymore. It's just yeah. not. Um, I think the states should have honestly pulled their thumbs out a bit earlier. If they were going to make the point of saying, uh, you know, uh, less flights, quarantine needs to be a federal issue, they really should have pulled their thumbs out way earlier on that and united behind it instead of being like, oh, well, it's in our lap now and we'll deal with it. You obviously can't. Hotels are not made for quarantine. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I think the blame does lie on everyone. I, I, I think that's. It the is, states it is wanted, the I've got to say though, the states and predominantly the labor led states, they were the ones that were championing these bloody hotel quarantine things because they wanted to control that aspect of it, like they want to do with the vaccine rollout. The problem in Australia, you are no doubt aware, is we are hopelessly over governed, which means more bureaucracy. Sorry, it'll come back on in a sec. I know, it's all good. Or it, it should. If it doesn't, I'll just get a new battery. <laughs> Well, that might have switched off for good. It normally comes back on fairly quickly. I, I, Sorry. I've actually used that app a few times. It's pretty solid. It's just, it, you're just it running it so that your camera is an external, right? Yeah. Spot on. I do a lot of uh, don't know, photography and video work and stuff. Yeah. So sorry, my... Uh it mustn't want us to talk about this. It must be the algorithm kicking in <laughs> <laughs> and uh, saying, nope, you said far too much that we disagree with on Google and Facebook and Twitter. Hey. Um it's look, I, it's an interesting thing because like I can, I, I'm always like, I'm always happy to play in devil's advocate because it's always that thing of like two sides of every coin, the rest of it. But it's been an interesting thing because realistically at the start of, I guess, mostly last year, earlier on the, like the labor states were definitely happy to jump straight into lockdowns. There was no doubt about that. But the flip side was that all the LMP oppositions and states were more about, oh, no, we should be opening up and the rest of it. Mm. Realistically speaking, if you look at every other country who tried that, it really didn't work. Like, it, it just didn't. So it's it, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because the other countries, honestly, as much as we can, we, we have, I guess, the opportunity to be more critical because we don't have, what is it, 700-something thousand deaths in the U.S., however many it is in England, like, yeah, we, we definitely had our little bit of a run and it's really unfortunate. Like obviously, you know, any death for any reason sucks, but proportionately speaking, we pretty much got away with it, you know? So at this point in time with that, there should be much better things in place, especially in Australia. Like we are mm -hmm. fairly insular. We can get away. I mean, at this point in time, especially after going in the music scene without gigs and the rest of it, even seeing the, the gigs that are capped at, you know, maybe 200 or whatever, mm. People want to go to gigs. People will flock out to gigs. Like, quite frankly, I had a good chuckle because the Bendigo Hotel was capping gigs at, um, I think it was 170 or something after the lock, the first set of lockdowns, which was um, apparently higher than New South and um, Queensland for a little bit because there was no sit-downs here. And I had a chuckle because I was like, oh, must be nice getting sellouts at the Bendy because there's no way you're getting 170 people usually on a Friday night <laughs> at the Bendigo Hotel. So it does go to show that people – you know, there's that thing of people going, fuck, I miss gigs. Like, you know, like, oh, I haven't been in a while or realizing that once it's not in front of you, it's like, oh shit, like I really did miss going. So I honestly do think like with everything, you know, the creative side of things, the creative fields, we're always getting the short end of the straw. It's never going to change. 
And we always bounce back because we don't do this for money. This is not because we're a business. It's not because absolutely. we're doing it. <laughs> so uh, it sucks. Like it it's absolutely purely a passion sucks. project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we look, we get shafted every single, every single day and every single turn, you know, there's no doubt about it, but it's almost like, is that news? Like, is that, is that a, is that a surprise to anyone? Has that ever been any different? So I think as much as it does suck, I don't see it changing when there's any opportunity to take, to take advantage of thriving on what we do. Everyone jumps to it. There's no one who falls behind and goes, oh, no, it's fine. I won't bother. It's everyone gets behind it because that's the beauty of being in like the heavy music scene. We, we absolutely support each other. And, you know, last year was, no different all the live stream stuff uh people you know going out and buying just heaps of merch and shit just supporting the bands they care about because like you said it's just, it's for our mental health it's for our emotional mm-hmm. state it's not for our wallet <laughs> so i'm i may be more optimistic than i should be about that given that i'm generally quite cynic, uh, cynical about stuff but been in this scene for like nearly 18 years or whatever now and it's always been a backbone it's always been something that's always risen regardless of what's happened and i just i don't see it being any different now i just think we have way more crap to have to deal with but so does everyone else businesses bands whoever it is i think maybe just this time around everyone else is copping the same shit we are or at least in the same field i should say we're still at the bottom of the pack but but it's you know a little more everyone's kind of copying it. So yeah, it's, yeah. it sucks, but we're, obviously everyone's trying to do what they can. And that's kind of all we, all we can do at the moment. So, you know, I'm still crossing my fingers that we might end up, you know, being able to play the show in New South Wales. If their lockdown goes well, it might be uh-huh. heavily capped, but I'd love to go. I haven't been to Sydney in a while and you know, that's all we can do. Just keep planning to make it happen until it doesn't. Well, you read my mind on the first question or first question yeah. proper that I was going to ask you, which was exactly that, which was that with all these bloody lockdowns going on and with the proximity of your gig, it's not about how likely do you think they're going to go ahead, mm. but um, okay, you've, you've answered it. I suppose you are optimistic that these things are going to go ahead because you've got mm. no other choice. Well, you're, yeah. in a, you're in a position where you're here to play music for the people with your mates in Triple Kill. Mm. Uh, I've, had a, I've, I've had a listen to your music. It was... Uh, I. Dicey, I think, sent through. Yeah. Dicey or Miller, uh, one of the two might have sent uh, a couple of things through last year. Very impressive. Yeah, yeah awesome, and dude. It, Thank you. And it's it's bands like you guys that I've got in mind whenever these lockdowns happen because mm. in order for the band's vision to be realised, in my opinion, the album's one thing, but live. Yeah, 100%. It, is where it needs to happen. So I take it preparations are just going, you're just doing what you'd be doing anyway, regardless of a pandemic with regards to preparing a set list and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I mean, driving perfectly into that, the lockdown that we just had in um, Victoria a few weeks back, we were meant to film two video clips, uh, do new photos. So we just announced new band member and all that. And that got pushed back. So obviously Dicey was like, Hey guys, this, 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 where's this and this. I'm like, can't leave the house, man. <laughs> like we can't do these videos. We just finished them luckily, but we crammed, you know, we just like did everything over like three full days and we just burnt ourselves out getting everything done. And it's just Spiced that thing of stock like, footage. <laughs> but, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> just, just do all the, but, but like with all the, um, the copyright imaging in the front of it too, just, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like we've been doing what we can, you know, we still catch up when we couldn't practice together mm. over our video chats and, you know, who needs to practice what send each other, you know, we, we have, Technology is wonderful these days. We will send each other. My brother will play something on the electric kit and sometimes send us the wave files. And then we can all practice to that and record our own practice so that we can technically send it off to each other and do one takes just to see how tight we all are. You know, Mm. so it's, I think these, you know, these days you can be like a band like Nabla Viscaris, you know, and and even Psychroptic who have members overseas, interstate, the rest of it and make it work. So I, I think there is a degree there where these days the preparation side of it really comes down to, how much you embrace the modern way of being able to do stuff. And I'm always quite interested in what's the forward thinking options and how to do things. Um, we wrote our whole album last year that, you know, the next one that we'll have out, we pretty much wrote the whole thing via zoom meetings. So, um, you know, we had our computers connected, we could hear each other's audio. So we'd be like recording into each other's PCs for the demos and stuff, you know? So it's, um, we just keep practicing, keep getting our stuff together. This Sunday is, um, the big prac with um, our new guitarist, Luke, who just joined. Um, okay. Joao, our longtime guitarist, has, um, is stepping down after this tour. He's um, uh, committed his pretty much his entire time to his social work career, which is awesome. 
Um, so he's kind of like moved on that way. And this Sunday we're sort of having that full prac of like the whole band, every member together who's playing this tour, just really looking forward to getting back in the room with the guys and, you know, going through that through set lists that we're sort of a being for the shows. That's, you know, that's why we do this. Like you said, it's the live thing, you know, if I, if I wasn't going to be practicing with the dudes or playing shows, I'd just be writing solo music, which I rather not, I'd rather be playing mm. in a band. Um, and that's why we do it. You know, I, I, whether it's 10 people, 20 people, 200 or 2000, I playing shows is the best part, you know, seeing people's smiles at the front, heads banging the rest of it. That's the best part of this. So, you know, the optimism is that thing of like, even if we end up playing New South Wales and it's capped at, you know, 50 people or something, that's 50 people I'm going to be stoked to play to, you know, and that's 50 people who are going to be stoked to be out of lockdown, who are going to see a band. So, um, preparing for that, hoping for the best, but we'll take it as it comes, you know, got to, that's kind of what we can do at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Such a great point. Assess, then adapt and evolve yeah. to that point yeah. there about writing music over Zoom and the bands that yeah. are doing that. I think are the bands that are going to come out of this intact because yeah, there, is, there is no end in sight with this, these, these lockdowns, given it is a zero sum game from the perspective that they yeah. want no community, zero community transmissions. That's an absolute fact. That's yeah. as, as delay the land right now is the government, the state governments expect or anticipate that they'll only, there won't be any more lockdowns until there are zero community transmissions. So for, for you guys, was that a hard, was that a hard, uh, or did, did it present a lot of challenges, so to speak, when you were making decisions about how you could move forward as a band? Yeah. In a weird way, like, I feel like it was way more disruptive to our day to day lives than the band because we, you know, some of us lost our jobs, some of us, mm you know, potentially looked at changing careers. Some of us had to move house, the rest of it is it's been really full on in that regard. But I guess from a music perspective, uh, I guess because this isn't an isolated thing, realistically, we've, you've seen how many bands from overseas, like, you know, the real like mid slash top tier bands have moved to us three, four times, you know, like Maidens had to do it again. Um, uh, the Megadeth one, that huge one got moved twice. Insomnium oh, have God, had to like yeah. cancel slash move like three, four tours. So mm -hmm. I don't think we're at any less of an advantage or any more of a disadvantage than anyone else. We look at it in the sense of like, all right, if we can't release an album, which obviously at the moment we're not going to, like we have most of the music done and we still have to you know, do all the final recording stuff. But I, there's no part of me that sees us releasing that album this year, but we've got this covers EP, which is fun. We've got content, which is exciting. And for us, it's like, it doesn't always have to be that cycle of album, 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 because quite frankly, that format of doing things as the only way is pretty dead. Like you can make things last longer and treat content a little more carefully and get that attention there because everyone, you know, everyone is out there doing music. Everyone is out there trying to get their slice of the pie. So I don't think we looked at this as a necessarily big disadvantage apart from, again, the playing live thing, which is a um, huge thing. Sorry, my cat's totally going to join because she does no, that. We've got a couple of them as well. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I know, know the feeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's, she's an absolute attention seeker. So she will find her way in front of the camera later. Um, but it really, it really was that thing of, um, for us making music and playing live, we look at it sort of very separately. We make the music that we love because we want to make it. We have the passion and, you know, drive to write songs, but we do it as a unit because we want to go play it live. So because we don't have that right at the moment, it's like, okay, well, you know, we started doing live playthrough videos and stuff. We started doing a few funny little skits and things. And like, for us, it's like, we, we just try to incorporate more, even more of our personalities into the content that goes up live. And, for us over the last maybe five years, that's been a really big thing for us. People have respond, excuse me, responded quite well to our, I guess, general personalities and antics because I don't know it's either stupid or funny. It's one of the two. Um, but I, I don't think we looked at it as like a bad thing in the sense of, well, oh, what are we going to do? Or are we going to, you know, is the, can we exist as a band because of this situation? We, we've never been that kind of band. We've always looked at it as, you know, regardless of what things have hit us, and the most inopportune things and the most, you know, fairly unfortunate events over time, we've always been pretty resilient. We've always looked at it and gone, all right, maybe everyone take a bit of a break uh, and come back. So like last year, download getting canceled was a huge one for us. So we're doing obviously that whole thing. Um, there was a two tours that we hadn't announced yet that obviously got canceled. Um, um, after that as well. Can you talk about, can you talk about which tours got canceled and with who? 
Uh, not stuff that we can actually like announce because it wasn't sure. things that were finalized and stuff. So it would, I wouldn't feel right just being, yeah, it's like we were meant to do this and it didn't happen sort of thing. Um, but download obviously being one of them. The other one was just joining onto an international band that was coming out um, and some other stuff later in the year, like looking at going to Europe and getting the ball rolling for that, which for us was again, one of the bigger goals that we've tried to get to a few mm-hmm. times. So when it all sort of fell apart, we just all went, all right, guys, look, maybe in the next three, th- three, four weeks, let's all deal with our own lives come back to it and have a chat, see how we feel because we were all just completely burnt, especially after yeah. all the stuff we prepared for experience. downloading. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we put so much time and effort into our live shows and like where they're going to be at now um, that we just, you know, we're practicing like two, three times a week, going through the full sets both ways, you know, having all the lighting, all the MIDI controls, just, you know, like a full live show every single track and putting everything into it. And then it all just kind of crumbled. So we, we knew we were in no state to, I guess, go through it rationally. It was like the whole world was experiencing this thing at once. And we were like, well, the music can wait, you know, it's not going anywhere unless we stop wanting to write it or play it, then it's, it'll be there, you know, we'll go, we'll come back to it. Let's deal with life a little bit more. And it was, I, I felt like that was the best thing. The the best thing we could do was that because when we did come back to it, we had, you know, pretty heavy chats about what do we want to do from here? Where do we want to go? But we all ended up not only more on the same page, pretty much in the same sentence. We all wanted it more than we had before. We were all passionate. And um, obviously, Joao had let us know where he was at with everything. And we were already like, you know, as hard as that was, we were like, all right, that's, you know, we know where you're at with your life and what you're doing. We know what we want. So there's no like surprises coming along. We know what we want. And we started that process of like, all right, well, let's, you know, get someone else on board behind the scenes and let's keep going. And we have been. So, I think I think it's just that expectations thing of we know things are not going to go back to normal for ages and they probably won't but there's always something that happens in some situation or other probably every like you know 5 to 10 years within the music scene that just changes the dynamic more and more Spotify mm. is a huge one I I'm still a massive you know that's one of my massive sticking points about changing the landscape and you know making things again even harder for bands even though the accessibility is greater it's something that just adds more to the whole not being able to make money as a band and having to tour even harder and all that and you know the the this pandemic has pushed even harder that bands have it tough so maybe out of this there will be more focus on how hard that is and maybe there will be some more realistic outcomes for musicians and bands outside of this you know sometimes these forced situations as bad as they are give us a bit of a wake up call to like, what do we actually want? What do we actually need to be able to do this instead of crashing and burning, <coughs> excuse me, um, because of how much we keep putting into it without necessarily the ability to pay it off. You know, we're, we're lucky because we're not making a living off this. Um, our tours, you know, tend to do pretty well. We, we, you know, we can pay our way doing our tours and the rest of it, which is all we ever really wanted. Um, but, that's a good position to be in for us because we're not necessarily going broke by not touring. Whereas there are other bands who are like, you know, we're getting 10 million streams on Spotify and the rest mm-hmm. of it, we're making no money unless we're touring eight months a year. And, you know, I'm, I feel for those bands, you know, you have Parkway Drive, Trivium, your Maidens, the rest of it. I mean, some of them obviously have enough that they'll be fine regardless. But again, that more, those newer bands that are taking that mantle, um, Parkway Drive being a huge example of that. And they've, they've been very upfront about all that stuff. And yeah, I'm just, honestly, I feel bad. I feel way worse for them than I do for bands in my position personally. Really? Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great point, uh, jumping point for my next question, which is actually about Spotify. Do you agree or disagree with this statement, Spotify and, and, and Apple Music, but agree or disagree with this, that the only way you can leverage the reach that these two platforms give to you as a musician is by spending a ton of money, whatever that might mm. be, on promotions on social media? Um, it's a hard one. Uh, I, I would be the first to say I'm probably out of touch these days with social media as much as some other people are. Like, obviously, I see so many bands who are, like, embracing TikTok and stuff like that, which is awesome. I just, we, we you know, we're just like, we don't have the time for that. Like, I don't, I don't want to have 50 social media accounts. And that's, that's sort of a, you know, that's a stop point for us that we as a band are like, we're spending more time promoting the band and sitting on Facebook or TikTok and whatever than we are creating music. It's not worth it. It's just, that's our personal thing. We want to enjoy what we do. Um, so it's, it's a hard one because Spotify is amazing if you're a consumer of music because you get access to everything, but that also has a converse issue with it because you have access to everything. 
And so a lot of the time things get overlooked. Um, as a producer, I work with bands who sometimes will be like, we really like this track, but we think we're going to cut the whole intro off it because if someone comes across it on Spotify, they might get bored. And I'm like, yeah. like that's a big like, issue. You know, that one. If, yeah. And like, you know, excuse Huge. my language, but fuck that. Like, do not sacrifice your artistic vision for some medium that is telling you what to do. And yeah, Chris, you, know, you know what I've noticed, you know, so sorry to interrupt, but just on that point, just before it flies away, I've noticed this increase in, you know, the Hellion Electric Eye, you know, the yeah, Juice yeah, Free yeah. song. It's two tracks, but really it's one song, but it's two tracks. Yeah. That's coming back. Now, I don't yeah. know why that was there in the first place. I don't know why Priest did that because I always considered it Electric mm. Eye. I don't know why they tack the Hellion bit on to begin yeah. with, who knows. But are you, are, I'm, because I get, I get sent hundreds of, yeah, it's hundreds, not thousands, of new releases each month, and I try to sift mm. through as much as I can. But I am absolutely noticing that when I import it into my um, player, mm-hmm. the intros, two and a half minute long intros, there might be waves crashing, creating ambience, this sort of thing. Particularly yeah. with the black metal bands when they've got yeah, wolves howling in the woods and all that bullshit. But they're a different track, mm. so so they're trying to game the system, which I don't blame them. Like I understand why they're doing it and go ahead and game the system at this point here. But, but it's, it's like we're constantly having to evolve or you, I mean, I'm a musician too. So that's why I say mm. we, but you guys that are in the spotlight playing extreme metal with some prominence, I mean, Dicey doesn't fuck around and he doesn't work with bands who can't do it. So that's a mm. great credit, great big green tick for you guys. But there's just, you said, and you made another point too, that, it's almost like as if, and I'm paraphrasing here, that, that you've got to spend so much of your time on social yeah. media instead yeah. of playing music. And I listen, yeah. I'm a writer, a journalist, and a podcaster, obviously. Yeah. I feel the same way. I it's feel like, the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, You're constantly barraged with this having to be connected at all times thing. And it is, it is just that's a t- part of the times, not just music, but um. I've gone down that rabbit hole enough and it's never been good for my mental health. And so that's something that I've pulled back from heaps. Like so true. we yeah. promote when we feel like we need to promote, but we're not going to sit there and do it every day. Like, Oh, quick, better put up a couple of sentences so that someone laugh reacts it or this and that. It's like, if we think we have something to put up, sometimes we share a dumb meme because we put it in our band group and someone's gone, ha ha, that's hilarious. And then one of us will go, actually, that's kind of relevant. We should totally post it on the band page because we can make that connection because we already think it's funny. But I'm not sitting there every day being like, all right, what did we put up on Instagram today? Um, has someone made a TikTok video? Why aren't we streaming on Twitch? It's like, we don't, like, you know, life's hard enough. Like if we're working full-time jobs and then I've got to worry about going home and spending two hours on social media before I even touch my instrument or worry about writing, I'm not doing it. <laughs> like that's just not, and if that is where things end up long-term, so be it. But there are a lot of musicians who've already, you know, who've been around way longer than I have and are way more prominent than we are who've made it pretty clear about their thoughts on that and where their actions are. Um, uh, Marco from Nightwish, when he separated from Nightwish, uh, it was last yeah, year. I saw that, that post yeah. broke my soul. Like it just, it was so honest. And from someone who's, you know, tours the world and, you know, I'm, I, I would be super confident that Marco is very well financially um, handled through Nightwish, but he made the point about it. it's just not worth it. Like, the amount of time that they have to spend on tour, on social media, the go, go, go game, like all of that sort of thing. He's just like, I just, I don't want to do it anymore. It's, it's, it's absolutely destroying my mental health. I'd rather be at home with my kids and just writing solo music. And it's like, yeah, like that's, that is what it is. And I think, you know, as time goes on, it's going to weed out the bands who decide to go their own way with things, which I think is probably the way forward. Like, you know, you look at people, I guess, like uh, extreme case, but someone like Matt Heafy from Trivium who started doing mm-hmm. his Twitch stuff because that was, you know, his downtime and whatever. But now because he can't tour with Trivium, he makes far more money on Twitch, but he basically sits on Twitch and plays guitar, practices vocals. And then when a tour comes up, the guy's like good as gold to go because he just spends, you know, seven or eight hours a day on Twitch practicing guitar and doing things he was yeah. going to do anyway. So I think that might be, more prevalent going forward, not relying on Spotify views and the, you know, however much Facebook decides to post and whatever that in direct connection between bands and the fans, like bands on Patreon and stuff. I know Nia Bliviscaris got absolutely skewered when they announced that they were doing that Patreon thing. It's not for me personally, but all power to them to be able to hone in on and go, look, if, you know, a percentage of our fans you know, and it's, it's no one's forcing anyone. So if, if a percentage of our fans are willing to put that money in monthly, 
then, you know, for the most part, we'll be able to sustain doing music all the time instead of never, maybe, maybe never quite reaching that point because of the way the system currently is working. So I completely respect and love that there are bands who are just taking it into their own hands and going, we're doing it this way and we're going to do it this way until it works. And I think that's, that's a big um, sticking point for me mentally going forward is remembering that if we don't do this our own way, yeah, we might not get, you know, much bigger or whatever it is, but I know that by the end of it, we're going to be happy with what we did instead of getting absolutely burnt by the end of it and realizing we spent more time worrying about who's seen what post and what social media channel we're on instead of doing the thing we love. So that's, that's just something that we've maybe become a little more aware of over time is making sure that whatever we do, yes, we do want to get bigger as a band. Yes. We want as many people to see us as possible, but it has to be in a way that is genuine to us and honest in who we are as a group and a band, instead of just basically doing, you know, throwing everything at the wall and hoping for the best instead of doing what we actually care about and, you know, can smile about at the end of, you know, doing the covers EP we you know, did some really mm. funny videos for them as well. And it's like, I feel like it's going to be more fun putting out a covers EP, which, you know, hopefully some people will catch on to and really enjoy. Um, and to do some fun videos to go along with it and let that be the promo until we have another album, do a tour and all that. Then to be like worrying about how many posts a day I'm going to do on Instagram or whatever else. It's just not something that, you know, I don't wake up in the morning thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 your take on things is very sensible and extremely reasonable, I must say, because I too saw the post that Marco put out there. I've had a chat to some of the members of, of Nightwish Floor mm. in particular. Yeah. I missed my chance to chat with Marco. I just didn't jump on it and had other things to do, et cetera. You know how things go. Yeah, but, yeah absolutely. Um, but uh, I did see that because I rate Marco. He, he, he's done yeah. he's done many things away from Nightwish. Yeah. His, his cover of Queen's, what's the Queen's song that he can scandal with the singer from Delane? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just incredible. I mean, it, yeah. it proves that he's not just a fantastic bass player and a musician, but a wonderful singer as well. Absolutely. And to see, I know he's back. I think he's got a new EP out or an album out, if I'm not mistaken, or he certainly okay. did a while. He, sorry, he had one a while ago, but it remains to be seen what comes next, I should say, mm. from mm. him. But, I mean, if, if a, an, a, an absolute astounding talent, such as mm. Marco was lost to the industry because of the way the wheels are turning at this point yep. in time. And what I mean by that is it just seems like this unstoppable freight train of basically consuming your attention 24-7. Yeah. And yep. and I just had an argument with a dickhead, one of the few that I've ever had on a cradle of filth forum because I've <laughs> developed a bit of a uh, subject matter expertise about the group because I've interviewed so many members. Yeah, but occasionally occasionally you bite back, right? You don't just sort yeah. of let it all go through to the keeper. Occasionally yeah. you go, hang on a sec, that's <laughs> not quite how things are. But yeah. it doesn't affect, I've got to say, it doesn't affect my mental health because I don't do it basically ever. That's like the second or third yeah. time I've ever done it in five years. But but, but for yourself, like with that fan engagement and the, and the like, you probably find that 98% of the engagements you have are very positive. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and, I mean, we've we've been lucky that you know, like of the, I feel like we've had a lot of weird luck, at least in the sense that for every tour we've done, every interaction we've had, yeah, like the vast majority have been super positive, and they've definitely outstripped the amount of interaction we've had online. Um, and I'm I'm super thankful for that. And like, you you get the occasional shit comment you get the occasional person who you know has to have a atten all attention on me while i you know try to shit talk someone because i need to feel better about myself and you know it it sucks obviously because you never really want people to just be bragging on you for no real reason or whatever but at the end of the day it's just like as you remember as soon as i like you know sign out of facebook or just, just move on with my day it doesn't freaking mm -hmm. matter like i don't care um doesn't pay the mortgage does it or put food on no, the table or, or help no. you become a better musician this shit does it yeah like, look, I, I definitely have, um, I, I am fairly politically engaged. I do enjoy a good debate and argument, um, but I always find it weird when I'll, you know, jump online and I'll be you know, having a chat with someone like fairly debate, debate heavy sort of thing. Not anything, you know, not anyone doing anything too ridiculous or calling each other names, just having a really intense back and forth chat. And then, you know, when I'm off and my files have finished exporting and the rest of it, I move on with my day. And I have people just be like, oh, I don't know how you do that. And I'm like, well, exactly what you just said, right? It doesn't pay the bills to have those arguments. Yep. Like, yeah, I can enjoy having the, 
the richness and you know, maybe there's some info that absolutely absolutely and then you know once you're off once you get off the computer you just turn around and you're like hey, i've got these other walls to worry about in my life and whatever <laughs> else like it was it was a hard thing for me to learn because i definitely didn't have that however many years ago um but i it was something that's been reinforced and i keep reminding myself that my life if you know if music stopped right now social media doesn't disappear the the world doesn't disappear and my life's going to keep going as it is like i'm still going to keep doing what i'm doing so i just remember that like segment stuff where you need to you know mental health is a very poignant you know sticking point where it's just take care of your mental health and you know sometimes you can have your arguments online or someone might say lock things away or this comment or whatever is not the crux of everything it's just one amongst the haystack so you gotta remind yourself of that every so often and just be like you know it's not you know not my circus not my monkeys and all that sort of thing yeah you do you do you got to put up those walls i think because at the end of the day you don't know i always say um i I used to use it uh with regards to road rage people get road rage i say look if someone's cut you off or they've stuck their finger up or whatever it might be Mm. they might have gone through the worst day of their life at that particular point lost their job i hate to say it god almighty god help me you know lost Mm. a child, this sort of thing. You don't know what somebody has gone through. So be measured in your reaction at all times, no matter what, no matter what is going Mm. on, because you just don't know what's going on out there uh, with people. I mean, there are, there are people that are just so sensitive that uh, not getting, not getting their order right at McDonald's is the thing that sets them off. And you you never know. (laughs) (laughs) Totally, totally. And it's like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just people are people whether it's online, whether it's within the music scene, whether it's in the line at Macca's, you know? So you just sometimes taking a bit of stock in realizing it is a, like a really cliche, but like at the end of the day, we are all in this together. We're all going through the same experiences, just different uh, event details, so to speak. So, you know, everyone, there are people who, you know, I, I remember like even last year, some people who were like fairly prominent um, characters around the world pointed out how hard they were having it and or like you know mentally I saw that yeah the and, actors you know, you'd have the people Hollywood actors like, were doing it yeah yeah but like you know you'd have some people be like oh how how effing hard is it when you're that well off and whatever it's just like you realize money doesn't just equate to mental health like oh yeah you have money but like you know some of the comedians that I follow a lot have pointed out how hard it's been for them after you know 20 same as I guess like touring as a band right 20 plus years on the grind doing all that touring, making all, you know, making all those jokes, doing all those shows going around the world. And then having that dead stop right in the middle of whatever you're doing and just being like, now what do I do with my life? Like Mm. I get it. At least your, at least your misery is in comfort because you're well off, but diminishing that other people's experience is just, you know, not as bad because they're well off or whatever it might be Mm. is just such a douche thing in my opinion to just sit there and be like, I'm going to judge you because you have money. It's like, so what, like, you know, th- th- that's not how the world works. Just being well off or not, or whatever the in-between is, doesn't mean that person doesn't have their own problems. It's mm-hmm. problems are problems regardless. Like, yes, there is a comparative thing there, but to say that it doesn't matter or to downplay it or like to poke fun at it, I think is pretty shit. So that's something that I did see a lot of last year that I was just like, how, why can't we just all agree? Everyone's having a shit time. Like, unless you're not awesome, but like, most people are probably having a really shit time right now because their life is just halted right in the middle. Stupid you know? thing. Sorry. Oh, I come back on. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. I don't know why it does that. It does that about every uh, half an hour or so I've noticed, except for when the battery, battery must have ran out before. must have been gremlins or ghouls in it. But anyway, mm. but you make, you make a, it's going to happen. Tech, oh, it's, I used to work in IT and uh, that's why I got yeah. out because yeah. I often say that people working in IT is like working with children. <laughs> I uh, used to do um, back-end web design, so... Oh God, that's that's horrible. Not coding? Fun. Were, you, were you were coding, were you? Yeah, no, nah, no thanks. I've tried a little yeah. bit of it, and uh, I'm not wired that way. I don't think in uh, bits and bytes and uh, in in binary equation form. But uh, yeah. I admire anybody who does. And let me tell you, at this mm. point in time in the world, you can make a mozza if you're good at it. We know that. But uh, you know, if you're uh, someone who's interested in the humanities, such as myself, yeah. it's um, it's you've got to do about like literally at the moment, I'm doing seven or eight things to earn money. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I yeah. 
I loved it at uni. I really, really wanted to do that as a career. And then when I went into the actual industry, I was like, I hate everything about this. And yeah, then, you know, decided that I would turn my recording hobby that I didn't do any studying for into like, no, I need to make this be a living because I actually like wake up and smile thinking about it. And then, you know, rather put 14 hours a day into that than something that by the end of it, someone's going to turn around and be like, I was just thinking, could you put like a pink unicorn in the corner? And you're like, what are you doing? What's stop? Like <laughs> trying to make a business website. And this is like, you know, all these, that, that whole way that the IT industry works where by the end of like all that work, you're just like, well, that felt pointless. So now, nah. yeah. Did you get that thing where, uh, say you did all this great work and by Friday you hand it to the client and you come back in on Monday, maybe Tuesday, and they come back and they go, my brother-in-law was saying that if you did this dot, 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 and you went, okay, how do I approach this? Apart from wanting to strangle the brother-in-law because he has no idea on coding and how things <laughs> do you actually that's work. How, like, <laughs> I don't know, do you reckon that's how, like, I guess doctors and virologists and stuff feel when they see people commenting about the COVID shit online? <laughs> like, well, my brother who works in construction thinks that this, this, and this, you'd be sitting there burnt. Yeah. Or, or he's a, he's, he believes in QAnon or any of that bullshit. And it's like, it's all set up. There's pedophiles in a pizza shop and you're like, have you got the fucking proof for this shit? Like, can you, can you please that, like, it's just it, garbage. <laughs> what's the, 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 um, Occam's razor thing of like the most likely, yes. um, outcome is uh, the most likely reasoning is probably the most, uh, likely chance of it being I can, true. Like, I can see that you like, study core probably, one and critical thinking. Nice yeah, work. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. you know, it's just like, oh, all, all, everyone in the government are pedophiles. Hold on, let's just pull that back a bit. The government has people in it. People can be pedophiles. Yep. Therefore, there's probably pedophiles in the government because there are pedophiles who aren't in the government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, or it's like, um, it's like Hitler had a dog. Hang on a sec. Do dog owners resemble Hitler? Who knows? We don't know about that. Maybe because they had a dog. Maybe they're like Hitler. <laughs> you hear this shit, and you're like, I can't even, you know, or the, you know, the fallacy of appealing to authority, confusion of correlation oh, yeah, and cause, yeah. all of this shit that goes on on social media, doesn't it? And you're like, you, yeah. you, you actually late at night. And I've got to confess, it might be one o'clock in the morning. You know, one of the kids has stayed up a bit too late because they're just wired or what have you. You see this shit in the Courier Mail or what's what's your the oh, age yeah. or whatever it is down there, and um, and you go, you start typing shit in, and you're like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't get, don't take yeah, the boat. Like, stop, stop, <laughs> stop the doing it. Down, the <laughs> go to bed. Go to fucking bed. <laughs> Read a book. <laughs> oh, it was really funny at, at uni. I had to do um. Obviously, it's totally off topic, but I, I had to do statistics as uh, part of a two semester um core subject for computer science. Sure. However. As far as statistical analysis jobs in Australia is concerned in IT, it makes up like 2%. So like I was like shattered. You don't like, use I freaking it. hate yeah. nah, I was like, I freaking hate statistics. Anyway, I did it. I did decently enough with it because I'm like, look, I'm going to have to try. I want to pass it. And the annoying thing is reading all this, like people putting data up about like COVID or even just anything really, but they'll put data up with no context and be like this, this, and this. And I'm just sitting there like, it annoys me that I can read that and discern things from it that you haven't. And I'm only annoyed by that because I want to correct you for being a freaking idiot. <laughs> but it's just like, not going to do it. Not going to do it. You do your thing. It's fine. You, you, could, you could sit there all day and read the Courier Mail or the Age or the Herald Sun mm. or whatever it might oh, yeah. be, the comment section, and just go, hang on a sec. And if you, you clearly, because we've both been to university, um, you use that training that we were given at university to pull apart these things. But it's like, to what end? To yeah, what well, end does this it. thing? Like, you're not, gonna, you're not no changing point. anyone's mind. And you know, I guess this to kind of circle back with everything going on and music and the rest of it. Everyone is even till now this far into everything. Look, re regardless of like, I guess the, um, how bad it may or may not be. The fact is we just haven't had this experience in our lifetimes and no one who is alive now has quite had this experience in terms of something that's been a global virus ex pandemic based thing. So everyone's fear response is always going to make sense to them. You know, like people want to believe that there's a global reset and freaking they're installed in 5g because it makes more sense to sit there and go, someone has to be in control of this <laughs> instead of taking a step back and the realizing that we're thing, basically yeah. just, you know, <laughs> neuron based flesh bags who are doing our best. Like that's it. There's, there's nothing, you know, like uh, whether you believe in the soul and anything spiritual, which no issues there, but, Outside of that, from the logical perspective, we there's nothing special about humanity as a whole. 
no one is that clever to control everything that much. And the fear response is the one that wins over, you know, majority of the time. People have to latch onto something to believe that this bad thing or everything that's happening, someone's controlling it. And it's like, it's just not. We're just, you know, we were climbing trees however many million years ago. Right now I get to play on stage to people. Like, let's just keep things in perspective here a little bit. So it's hard. It's hard because I've, you know, I've been there. I've done a few things where I've been like, that was shit. I, that response was just me being stressed about stuff. And yeah. I really tried to avoid it or I try to like at least be like, hey, look, here's some clarity because I was having a shit day or whatever it is. But if we all sort of fall into that trap, then, you know, like it's just nothing yeah, but just chaos. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and you, got, you got to think too, how long have we looked like the way we look now as Homo sapiens sapiens? Is it 500,000 yeah. years or thereabouts? It's whatever yeah. the period of time is. The point yeah. is if we accept, and I think I think on available evidence we have to, that Sumeria was the first example of civilization in terms of towns and cities, this sort of thing, building grain silos and, yep. and real yep. agriculture, this sort of thing, um, for, for permanent townships and settlements. That was six or 7,000 fucking years ago. It's okay. nothing. It's nothing. On a, on, a, on a football pitch, it's it's less than using a rugby league parlance. You're talking, yeah. about, you're talking about like 30 centimetres before the try line. In terms of the yeah. whole thing, if, you, if yeah. you take it how far you've got to run from where we have been on the opposition oh, trial line, to, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And we're still figuring things out. That's the point. Yep. It's, and, you know, it's, it's, that, that's such a good point of that perspective of like, I can, like looking at that and going, you know, from like 5,000, you know, like the pyramids, right? 5,000 years ago, I'm like, oh man, that's amazing. And it's like 5,000 years is nothing. The fact that you look at, um, you know, people make the joke about Jurassic Park, the movie, where, everyone's like, I don't care how unrealistic everything is. The worst part is the fact that half of those dinosaurs didn't even exist in the Jurassic period. They were like 6 million, 7 million years too early. And you're like (laughs) 6 or 7 million years too early for these dinosaurs to exist in the same plane of existence. And we're, you know, worried about, you know, like you said, exactly that point of like 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 years. It's it's nothing. It's actually a blink blink of an eye in, 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 in evolution, in evolution time. Yeah. And we're still and we're still powering cities and infrastructure with dead dinosaur material and foliage. We, there you go. It's it's there you crazy. Go. It was with such a nuts. And and people wonder why. And God knows if there are aliens out there. There probably is, but God knows. I mean, it's probability is that there is, of course, yeah. because how could there not be? But if they're observing us, you just got to think that they've taken a long drag of whatever the equivalent <laughs> of their cigarette is and gone, look at these assholes <laughs> with their oh. nukes and their, their their tribal warfare, their advanced primates. Oh, 100%. And look, I feel like I have, I find comfort in that thought because it just makes me remember that, again, like there, we have some incredible human beings who invent stuff every day. And even from a music perspective, right? Like heavy metal didn't even exist like 40 years ago. Yeah. Electric guitars with distortion didn't exist more than 50 years ago. And the rest of it, like, if you look at it in that perspective, going from that, to like you know, flying was so expensive and such an such a um, in the eighties, in the eighties, it was expensive. In the early nineties, yeah. even yeah, yeah, dude. And we're you know, let's and let's we're lucky that we've gotten to a point that I can look at a Jetstar flight and be like, hundred and twenty bucks to Sydney, what a rip! Like, you know, you, you take put that sort of lens on a little bit and just be like, oh yeah, we're, like we're living <laughs> in a pretty insane like time to be doing anything, and there's you know things are always going to get better. There's always going to be a push for progress and the rest of it. And right now things are really shit, but it's going to look at that lens of like, yeah, it is. Everything sucks really bad right now, but probably better off living through a pandemic now than a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or whatever the rest of it is. Like I can still sit here and write music, talk to you on my phone via a camera, you know, Mm -hmm. like there is a lot to at least, and not everyone is in that position. There are a lot of people who are doing genuinely super super tough and those are the people i feel for the most everyone else who's inconvenienced and the rest of it i get it freaking sucks but you're still sitting at home watching netflix on your 65 inch tv there are worse things you there haven't are, got a really lot to complain about things. have you i mean we've got a hungry jacks within uh, 500 meters of where i'm sitting at the moment same thing with the coals uh same thing with a bottle shop okay i've got the cane fields over this way if i want to feel it as though i'm amongst nature like i did today yeah you know living in a semi-rural area like i do in queensland nice um you know i've got the two wonderful kids who are healthy uh mm. and who are doing pretty good at school okay i've got a lovely wife who i genuinely love there's and i've got a roof over my head which isn't going to collapse anytime soon because we don't live in an earthquake zone 
Um, you know, we do get a, a few cyclones occasionally, but they're sort of 10-year yeah. events or floods that are sort of 10-year yeah. events yeah, or 20-year yeah. events, what have you. But statistically speaking, and this is a great point, there has never been a better time to be a human being. No, no never. Way. We've got no. so much going for us at the moment. It's about where attention goes, energy flows. Yep. You know? And I don't know if I've just like gotten older and gotten more zen as time's gone on. It's probably just the case. I feel like I should be walking on the cane <laughs> at this point. Um, but it is like I do try to take stock in that and remember, you know, sometimes I do just like look around even in my house and I'm just like, my, I've got my partner living with me. I've been lucky enough that we live together during lockdown. I've got my two cats. I've got my studio. Like I'm so happy. And not again, not everyone gets to be that lucky, but I just remember that I am lucky in that situation. It's like, I can't play gigs. Freaking sucks. Don't get to see my band members. Lockdowns are freaking shit. I am lucky enough that I'm living in a time where I can talk to them over the phone. I can talk to my mates overseas. Like I can talk to them in real time and the rest of it. So it, it's, yeah, like it's proportionate, you know, like it's like when people talk about recording to tape and stuff like oh, back in those days, but you talk to the musicians from back then and they're like, if I could be recording in Pro Tools 30 years ago, I would have fucking recorded in Pro Tools 30 years ago, yeah. not, you know, having to do one take and it's like, that's all we got. Sorry guys. You know, <laughs> so it's, you gotta remember like every, every uh, era we live in or exist in is always the most advanced one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, whether you're a freaking vaxxer or anti-vaxxer, go nuts, do your thing. But the fact that we do have the technology and know-how to go, oh, we have a similar virus to this. If we get enough money to actually put this together in a short amount of time and do all the things we need to do, we can probably get a vaccine together. That's mm. pretty insane. Like that's, you know, super insane. Um, our our bass player, Leon, um, is some form of chemical biologist, sub- chemist, I don't want to say exactly what his label is because I'm sure I've gotten it wrong. Um, but they do a lot of like his company does a lot of checking for like, you know, uh, just like chemical based stuff and like uh, a whole bunch of different um, um, substances and all that. And he'll just, you know, talk to us about random stuff that was happening at work. And, you know, to him, it's just frivolous work stuff that he's like, Oh yeah, this happened. And I'm just sitting there just in awe, just like, that's amazing. You know, like, like I record bands for a living and I love it. But like when he, mentioned something that makes that brings me back to realize like how far we are as a species and what we can actually do. Yeah. So it's pretty incredible. So it's, it is, you know, still mind blowing whether you, whether you, you know, again, even with the vaccine stuff, whether you take it or not or like it or not, whatever, but like can't it's take there. away how amazing it is that that exists. So, yeah. you know, yeah, we don't like yeah. Sean Stevenson who since passed away uh, said, uh, I'll never forget what he said. He says, we, we don't lack, resources what we lack or strategy what we lack is the application of resources and strategy it's just people's willingness to buy into it and go okay there it is there you know every and and here's another thought it's a bit philosophical but here i go every problem that you've ever faced somebody else has dealt with already every single one that's that's it yeah 100 oh, percent, man that and that yeah that's exactly it like the whole event detail thing everyone else mm. there's someone out there who's had that, who's dealt with it or whatever. And the beauty of connection, I do, you know, it's the, the one thing social media is meant to be doing, <laughs> not that it is, but <laughs> the beauty of having those connections is for people to share experiences, share solutions, share problems and have that community Absolutely. based. Um, it's meant to be like, you know, like, like a productive hive mind, even when it's not. Um, but that is, that is where we're at. And that, that thought, regardless of whether you do have those connections or not, it, it doesn't, doesn't change. That is exactly right. People, there is always someone else out there who's had, had that problem or had a solution to that problem or an outcome and the rest of it. So yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, you're in a killer heavy metal band. That's got a tour coming up. You've got five shows. Unfortunately you won't make Queensland because I'd love to, to get along to a gig in Brisbane, Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast. There or are is that things changing? happening under that. that, that oh, okay. the, I mean, it won't be as part of this tour, but we, we do have things happening because Queensland was the first place we ever toured outside of Victoria and I can't wait to come back. Um, <laughs> we, we will have some stuff to announce at some point about that. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping because, yeah, definitely can't wait to come back up. 
I love I love what you've done too with the split EP with Triple Kill. I know you spoke about that way at the beginning of the conversation there, but uh, look, the reality is the gateway into heavy metal is bands like Green Day and um, uh, Fountains of Wayne and these sorts of oh, bands. Yeah. Because, mate, I tell you what, it's it's very it's pretty much the same. I know people don't like me saying that sort of stuff, but distorted guitars, four four to the floor yeah. drumming. Yeah. You know, the the, the musicians uh, they might look a bit different, but the way that they the approach is virtually the same. Yeah. So. You know, you, you've thought about that. I know Lord have had a lot of success with their covers yeah, yeah, album. Absolutely, um, Andy, Andy, and the lads there have done gangbusters there with that bloody um, Savage Garden song yeah. that they've it's done. It's a great, great cover, great cover. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a quick. I did. I have an interaction with him. Or who did I speak to? I, I spoke to Andy occasionally over yeah. uh, Messenger. Um, and uh, yeah, but those guys have got their fingers on the pulse around. Mm. Look, it's just about producing things that appeal. I mean, you're always going to have your albums and stuff like yeah. that. But in between, you can do these things that I think are appealing to people. You know, you've done that. And just to give the listener some idea of the, because of course I host a podcast series. Uh, when I say uh, that you've done Fountains of Wayne, or, or actually your mates in Triple Kill have done Fountains of Wayne and Paramore, you've joined together on Skater Boy with, uh, you, you've teamed up for Avril Lavigne's Skater Boy. And then you guys have done, I mean, the three, I've got to be honest, the three pick of the songs there because I'm in a covers band and I've played all three literally hundreds of times. Yeah. Blink 182 is all the small things. Green Day's Basket Case and the big one, The Living Ends Prisoner of Society, which always gets a massive pop. So, yeah, mm. ki- killer and work do, on the EP, yeah. I really appreciate it, dude. And, I mean, coming back to that, that was something fun for us. You know, we wanted to do it because we wanted to have fun. And, you, you know, these are bands that influenced us. Like, the Triple Good Dudes, uh, a few of them are a bit younger than us. So even those, like, the Paramore and our Rule of Bean stuff, and they're way more out there with their covers. They just, you know, really love having fun with some crazy stuff. You know, they've done, um, what is it, um... Uh, what is it? Uh, the Rick Rick Rolled song. Freaking what's his? Oh, Rick Astley. they're going to give you up. Yeah, whatever so it is. They, yeah. They, they've done that live and stuff, and so they went that route. Whereas, you know, we did bands like you said that got us into music and stuff, or that we really enjoyed before really getting into the heavy metal stuff. And Living End is a huge one for me. Green Day is a huge one for most of us. Um, and Blink One Eight Two is just one of those bands. Even if I don't think Blink One Eight Two is not the favorite of any of us in the band, but. Anytime there's a Blink-182 song on, tell me that someone doesn't know the lyrics. You know, find me a metalhead who doesn't know a Blink-182 song. I've seen it, brother. Get get four or five beers into people and start playing bloody, like, one. you know, that one or what's the other big one? Damn it. That sort of stuff. But they're the first ones up the front spilling beer on each other and hugging when that shit comes on. Yeah. I've seen it firsthand. (laughs) We did a um, Halloween gig a few few years back now. On our end of, it was like a Christmas Eve gig or something. Somewhere around that, yeah. And we did like a dress up thing and um, we were, uh, Triple Kill actually played that one as well. And we finished up the gig. Um, you know, I think we, we played an Inflames cover. Triple Kill did something else. Like, you know, no, nice. no pop, pop stuff or anything like that. And then, you know, we get off stage, start listening. And I'm like, is that a Simple Plan song? Is that Green Day? Is that Avril Lavigne? And then by the end of it, all, every metalhead in the room um, is just sitting there singing along to these freaking like old pop punk songs and the rest of it. And it's just like, yeah, man. Like they're fun. They're great. They're great songs. So we had fun. We had fun putting them together, trying to, you know, Orpheus them up a bit. Same with Triple Kill. Like those, those guys just, when they arrange a cover, it's just like, it may as well be a triple, triple Kill song. They're so good at it. <laughs> um, but we just, we put it together and we had fun. You know, the, I don't know if um, it came through with what Dicey sent, but the cover of it is effectively, we got Tristan Tate um, from Tristan Tate Illustrations, who's an incredible artist. Absolutely incredible. Check it out. So basically yeah. um, he's redone the Dookie cover. <laughs> but with us all uh-huh. dying on the front of it in different ways. And so it's just, we, we had such a blast with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to to play the songs live and release the video clips once we've, you know, got the finals. It's just, it's a fun time. And I think people need fun at the moment, you know, not everything has to be super serious all the time. Yeah. I, I'm on, I'm- you're on point again, man. We've agreed on a lot through this chat, but I mean, it is what it is, and and we do need to have fun because it is fucking serious. And and if you we keep taking ourselves, well, what is it? You know, never take what you do seriously. Never take who you are seriously. One hundred percent, man. One hundred percent. And we we try to live by that. I think we spent a lot of the early years as a band taking everything too seriously, and then you know a lot of our influences are like in terms of uh the the approach is bands like Killswitch Engage, Trivium, and the rest of it. Bands who yep. just their music is serious. They, you know, they are very serious about writing their music, but as people and as a, as a unit, they're very fun. They're just enjoying themselves. And I think we quickly caught on after a few years and just went, we're not, we're not a serious band in that way. You know, we're just, we're never going to be the band who comes out in like the super 
you know, super stank face, just riffs, yeah. whatever. We're just, we enjoy having fun. Like our keyboardist will like kick me in the back while we're playing and I'll just go over and like put my arm over and play stuff and we'll poke each other with our guitars. All the while we're playing, you know, 230, 240 BPM melodic death metal. Sure. But we try to have fun, you know, try to make sure the crowd has fun and you know, it all goes back to the live thing. We we have the best time when the crowd's having the best time and whether it's 20 people or 2,000 people, it's just like, as long as everyone is having a good time, everyone leaves smiling. That's, that's not, I could, couldn't, nothing else could make me happier. That's, that's really, that's, that's really it. You're in, you're in a killer band. You've got a couple of killer releases there. You've got a re-release out of your debut album, if I'm not mistaken, or your yep, second album yep. coming out uh, fairly, fairly soon. It's, it's all happening. It's just a matter for people now to turn up. I sincerely hope that the Queensland shows go ahead. And uh, I just haven't been able to get to the last few that the lads have put on, but uh yeah, you know, when uh, Black Renault are playing up here and stuff, but I'll definitely try to get oh, yeah, out for yeah. you guys, whether you play at Moe's or at, at Marsden there at the hotel, maybe. Well, they're the only two places these days, I think, to play, unless the bright side is kicking back off in the valley, but I don't know what's going on there. I think it's still a little bit off till our shows um, crop up, so I'm not sure what the final decision was on venues over there, but we're actually playing with um, some bands up there who are doing some stuff, so we're just excited to come up, really. It's going to be yeah. like, sort of like a family get-together, which I'm really excited about. It is a lot like that in Australian metal at the moment, and I've said it before, and I mean it, and I'll say it to you. But I, I'm 43. I've been into metal since I was 12 or 13. I grew up in the deep dark 90s, when uh, you know there were some good bands around like Allegiance, but they were few and far between. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sadistic Execution, Allegiance. They were the, these were the bands that I got into back yeah. then. Australian bands, more, uh, Mortification, Mortality. You know, yeah. but but there was six or seven to be honest with you, yeah. and everybody else sounded like Morbid Angel or Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> these, these days you've got, you know, Orpheus Omega, you've got so many killer bands hidden in tent, um, you know, Lord, you know, the list, the burial pit. Oh, it's, you could Fuck, not spend man. a whole week listing how many good bands there are in Australia. It's world we, class. We do have, yeah, 100%. It's world class, like you guys, mate. I mean, it's it's no disrespect to Australian metal to say you guys could sound like you're from Norway or Sweden or something like that. Yeah, which is, no, I totally, well, I totally as, get as it. For me, being around when Slaughter of the Soul came out, I remember when that shit came yeah. out. Like, yeah. like I was like, yeah, shit's taken a left-hand turn now. This is where heavy metal's going. I knew after that. Yeah. I got it about a year after it came out. But the point is, is that I knew when I heard that in Dark Tranquility, metal yeah. was going to sound different. and. And I feel like mm. as though it's it's taken us some time, I think, to get to the point, and it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Yeah. You know, people like yourself that have grown up and understand metal, you're clearly an intelligent fella. You know, I think metal in this country has evolved to a point where, where we, with bands like you guys, man, and the other bands that I've mentioned, we're just at a point now where you could actually, and I want to see this, and I hope Dicey and Miller mm. can potentially do this, don't know if plans are afoot, but put in a proper... Aussie metal festival, a yeah. bit like that fucking spring loaded thing. I froze well, my ass off that recently. Yeah, you, you say that, and you know, and look for me, I produce music for a living. The majority of it is Australian metal or Australian mm. music in general. But realistically, for me, I've always, you know, when people are like, "Oh, how come you're not really pushing to work with more overseas bands?" and I'm like, "They're fine." <laughs> like our pool of bands, the upcoming bands that are like super young, are incredible, and I if I can impart anything useful to them or do anything helpful to make their, you know, their coming up in the scene a little bit easier, a little bit more streamlined and just give them any, I don't know, any dad advice that I can really in the process, then I'll be stoked because our scene is incredible. The musicians are incredible. And it's because we have to fight like hell for it. Um, mm. And exactly to what you said, I think let's be realistic. We're not going to get, you know, we, we, we've toured with like Insomnium and Omnium Gatherum and stuff like that. And we bought those kinds mm. of bands out. The, the real, like, you know, they, they kill it overseas. But as far as like the Aussie out, uh, apps so and all cool. that is, they're yeah. still in that like mid high tier metal bands, but not your like, you know, arena headliners or anything like that. We're mm. not going to see those bands here again for a while. It's just not going to be feasible money wise. Flights are too expensive. Visas are expensive. With everything going on pandemic wise, no one's going to put the money on it. So, let's go back to maybe, you know, 10 plus years ago where we were pushing those massive Aussie bills, like your Sonic Forges and stuff that Tim from Neo used to put on, um, Metal yep. for the Brain and all that. Uh, you've obviously got Jason North doing your um, New Dead and the rest of it. You guys have, um, was it uh, Dead of Winter and stuff and a few yep. others. Let's get these tours moving around the country. Like, let's, let's put that spotlight back on Australian bands because you cannot tell me that we don't have enough bands to put on the kind of festival that would rival any international quality. Cause we do, we have them, they, they exist. So I, I, I want to see that. And I, I want to do my best to help 
in any part I can to, to help make that happen. Because I, I, I would have no issues if all I was stuck with was seeing Aussie bands because they're great. The shows yeah, at I've this been point to in time, lockdown. Oh yeah, yeah. Like at um, this point in just, time, I, I don't think we've ever had the quality we've got right now in no, 2021. No. And honestly, I'm saying that as a 43 year old, you'd think that I'd be <laughs> the guy saying, "Listen, I was in the pit in Sad X back in 1995." You, I don't was know there when Mortal Sin started down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there are people around like that shit, and they're like, "Oh yeah. no, you would know, man." It's like, yeah, I do know because I was there. Okay, yeah. and and I didn't get to go to too many gigs, but I was certainly, you know, yeah. trying to go to the venues and stuff and hanging around and stuff. I got what it felt like. It doesn't feel like it does now. Yeah, it's it's better now than it ever has I, been. Yeah, from a vibe yeah. and from a personnel perspective and the way we can have these sorts of conversations, mm-hmm. it was pretty much a closed shop before. If you didn't have yeah. long hair, you were told to get fucked in some circles. Yeah. dude, you and, know. and you're right. And it's it is it's it's the times, you know, and like we. The metal scene, honestly, the metal scene is full of people I just don't recognize in any way, shape, or form because I, I feel like it's fossil at this point. But seeing all these bands coming up and being able to go to gigs that I'm like, these are new people, you know? Mm. This is not just all the dudes in my 30 to 40 age group that I grew up with, you know, when I was younger. It's the new kids. Like, you've got, like, the dudes from Primitive, uh, Iron, Stone, Ascari, and all these younger bands who are mm. smashing it, who are pulling people to gigs, people that, you know, again, I just don't recognize at all from a dress sense, from any of it coming into the scene you know these are yep. these are the future of the metal scene and they're just bringing in all these different types of metal all these different types of music into it and you know like i said i just i i'm constantly excited by it and i, I realize if i was ever not excited by it that's probably when i'd have to throw the towel in and be like it's not for me but yeah. i'm more excited now 13 years into being in this band than i was when we started so i'm going to keep putting that energy out i know we are as a band guys like triple kill and the rest of it they, you know, we're just going to keep giving it 110 percent while we can for as long as we can, and hopefully, mm. if, if there's any benefit to the scene from us doing that, and every other band who does it, that's that's all that matters as far as I'm concerned. Killer brother, great great note to wind up on. Thanks for tuning into my chat with Chris from the Melbourne band Orpheus Omega. If you like that conversation and you want to hear more just like it, there are well over 550 over at scarsandguitars.com. I'd appreciate it if you could like, subscribe and share, but even better, leave a comment. Trust me, it all helps. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. It's goodbye for now.